It's good to be with you all today, and I'm so glad to see each of you. We love our kids at the Edmund Church of Christ, and we're glad each of you are here. We're so happy to see you on this Mother's Day. You know, no matter what our age, all of us have moms, and it's so nice to have a mom that loves and cares for us. Do you love your mom? Raise your hand real high if you love mom. And if if you think about the love that your mom has for, for you, How much does your mom love you? Can you show me with your hands? Does she love you this much? And when you think about how much she loves you, how does it make you feel? Does it just kind of make you feel all warm? Show me with your arms how your mother's love feels. Isn't it wonderful to have moms and grandmoms and others who act like moms in our lives that care for us and love us and are there for us? And isn't it fun to make people we love happy? Think of the things that you can do that makes a smile come to your mom. In fact, if you're kind of wondering about it, ask your mom. Mom, what makes you happy? What can I do that makes you happy? I'm sure she loves to get gifts from you. She loves it when you listen to her or obey her. When you pick up your toys, your mom smiles when you're kind to your brothers and sisters or others. There are so many things that we can do to make our moms happy. And I'm sure our moms are never happier than when we do things that God has asked us to do and what God wants us to do. Look at this beautiful verse from Proverbs 23, 5. Make your father and mother happy. Give your mother a reason to be glad. So maybe take a minute today and ask mom, what makes you happy? And then do those things and watch that beautiful smile come on her face. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. Hello, Edmund Church family and friends across the country and around the world. It is good for us to be together to worship today. And as Kent said, it's Mother's Day, so to all you mothers and grandmothers out there, happy Mother's Day. Now normally, it is our tradition on this day to hand a rose out to every mother in the crowd, but obviously we cannot do that today because we aren't physically together. But moms, I want to tell you how much on behalf of the congregation we appreciate you and love you. And although we don't have anything to physically give you today, we give you our love. At the same time, it is important for us to acknowledge those people for whom this day can be difficult. Maybe you've lost your mother. Maybe even recently you've lost your mom. Or maybe you want to be a mother, but for whatever reason, you can't be. Maybe you've lost a child. Maybe you've lost a pregnancy. We want you to know that if this day is difficult for you, our hearts go out to you. And it is our prayer that you experience the peace that only God provides. You are in our hearts and our minds. It is Mother's Day, and usually when we hand out these roses to our moms, our students hand those out, and I have the job of killing some time while that happens. And so it is somewhat of a tradition that occasionally I will write a little poem for our mothers on Mother's Day. And... For better or for worse, I did that this time. And so here is today's Mother's Day poem. Roses are red, violets are blue. Even in a pandemic, Mom, we haven't forgotten about you. We normally give you a rose on this very special day. But to honor you this year, we'll have to find another way. We aren't together all in one place. But we still want to say thanks and put a smile on your face. We want to buy you a big gift maybe even give you a ride in a limousine, but we can't go to the store right now because we are all under quarantine. So have a great day. We want you to be happy. Remember, you are loved. And by the way, I'm sorry, this is so sappy. As you can imagine, I got no response in this room of about eight people, which would have been the same if the room would have been filled with hundreds of people today, I am sure. But we do want to wish all of our moms a happy Mother's Day. And we hope that you will stay tuned to the end of our service because we have a very special video to celebrate moms. As we set our hearts and minds now for worship, I want to remind you of something very important, something you need to always remember, and that is that God loves you dearly, that God lavishes his love upon you. And now we have an opportunity to worship the God who loves us 
And so I would encourage you not just to be a viewer at home or wherever you are, but to be a participant in worship today. Honor the God who loves you. So let me call your attention to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. You might want to read this out loud where you are. He writes, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Let's worship together. church family. It's good to be with you virtually this morning. Please join me in reading some scripture and offering a prayer over our worship. Today we're going to be reading from Luke 15 verses 22 through 24. It says, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Join me in prayer. Dear Father, we are so grateful for your church. We've always known that your church transcends a building and it transcends place. In this unique time, uh, we feel that. We are in different rooms and we are spread all over this city and in many cases all over this country and even around the world. And we are coming together we're grateful for the technology that allows us to do that, Father, and I pray that even though we are physically separate, we will feel one another's presence in the rooms that, in which we sit, in which we pray, and in which we worship together, Father. We're mindful of our mothers today, for the women in our lives who care for us and nurture us, and remind us of the importance of reaching out and loving others, pouring into others. We need that in this season of time, I'm grateful today is a day that we celebrate mom. For those of us who can't be with our mothers today, of which I know there are many, or those of us who don't have a mom in our lives, Father, be with the brokenhearted today, be with those who feel distance. I pray that they would find great joy uh, in the people that are in their lives currently and the people who have been in their lives in the past who have represented that nurturing and giving spirit that you've blessed us with. Be with us during our worship today. I pray that, again, while we are at a distance, we could praise you in a way that is meaningful, that is rich, and that is so deeply authentic, Father. We love you. We're grateful you're in our lives and you're in this world. Redeem this world, Father, and redeem our worship today. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.
I want you to take just a moment to think about your experience right now. What are the things that are on your heart right now? What are your fears, your anxieties? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? What's going on in your heart right now? Now expand the circle a little bit and think about the people that you may be sitting at home with right now. And if you're not with anyone, think about your immediate family, the people who are closest to you. What's going on for them? What are those same stories for them? Let's open the lens a little bit more and think about your community, your neighborhood, the people that live close to you. What is their experience? What's on their heart? What's going on for them? What about our entire community, city of Edmond? What's happening for them at the moment? Our entire state, our entire country, take the lens all the way out and look at everybody on earth, 7.8 billion people. What is going on for each one of them today? What is their experience? What are their worries? What are their hopes? And even that is just a, a momentary snapshot of the human experience, from Adam's first steps to the last person to walk on the earth. We are just one story in a sea of humanity. Even that is just one piece, too, because we float on this tiny blue marble in the vastness of space and a tiny little galaxy and a universe that we have only begun to scratch the surface of understanding. There's an infiniteness and a massiveness to the universe. It's easy to feel very, very small. It's easy to feel very insignificant. But I have really good news for you. I have a message of hope, and that message is that the God that created all of that wants a personal relationship with you. He cares about the things that are on your heart. He wants you to share those anxieties. He wants you to share that hope and those victories with him. He wants to walk with you through your life. But there was a problem in the story of humanity, and that problem was sin. Sin entered the world, and he could not have the kind of relationship with us that he wanted. So he had to do something extreme. He came to earth and he died for us. The God that spoke into existence the entire vastness of the universe, that holds more power than we can even fathom, and that knows the number of hairs on the head of every person who has or ever will walk on this planet, went to great lengths to rescue you and wants to walk with you and have a relationship with you. Let's spend some time focused on that thought as we 
partake in our communion time this morning. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble call? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you so much for caring about us. We thank you so much for being interested in who we are and interested in our lives, the concerns that we have, the hopes that we have. Uh, we know that you are a God of love, that loves to, love defines you, and that love is the way that we show who we are, that we are your children. We thank you so much that you raised us to being the status of of sons and daughters, and we, we just appreciate the sacrifice that you made and the gift that you made to reconcile us to you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we want to thank you so much for the gift of your son. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that he lived. We thank you for his words. We thank you for the example that he provides. 
We thank you for the healing that he did for the people that he walked with and the healing that he provides for us. We thank you for the example that he was and the, the wisdom that he taught and shared and the way that our lives are different because of him coming to earth. We thank you for the sacrifice that he made. We thank you for his death and we thank you for his resurrection. And it's in his name we pray, amen. At this time, we've set aside some time to focus on giving. The story of God's reconciliation with humanity is a powerful one. And one of the main missions of the church is to share that story with as many people as we possibly can and to take as many people to heaven as we can. One of the ways that you can participate in that is through giving. And so we've set this time aside to focus on that. Uh, you see on the screen several ways that you can participate in that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your plan for the church. We thank you for this community. We thank you for this body that can come together to walk in, in your way and do life together. We thank you so much for giving us the job and the responsibility of being your ambassadors, of communicating your message to the world. We ask that you help us to do that effectively. We ask that you help us to take that job very seriously. And we ask that you help us to uh, be responsible with the resources that we have been blessed with as we navigate that responsibility. Again, we thank you so much for the death of your son, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to be where you are.
Many of us are spending a lot of time at home right now. And although life at home during this unusual season is probably a bit different, there are some things about home that don't really change. Home is where family is. Home is where we celebrate. Home is where we have routines and schedules, where we spend time together, where we gather around the table. Home is where we laugh together and sometimes cry together. Home is about security. Home is about comfort. Wherever God is, that should be home. You see, throughout Scripture, God is referred to as our Heavenly Father, and the church is referred to as family, brothers and sisters doing life together in a community of faith and a family of God. So being with God and God's family should be home. But unfortunately, some people have left home. Maybe that's you. Maybe for whatever reason, you have chosen to leave your spiritual family. You have chosen to leave home. Maybe you feel like you've outgrown home. Maybe you're ready to leave the nest and experience all that the world has to offer, and so you've left. Maybe you were disappointed. Maybe you were hurt. Maybe you felt like you were pushed out of your spiritual family. Maybe you know what it's like to leave home. I want to encourage you today, if that's you, if that's your story, if you have left God and the church for whatever reason, I just want to encourage you to consider making a move home, taking those first steps back home. Or maybe you've never had a spiritual family. Maybe you don't know much about God. I would encourage you and invite you as well. Would you consider coming home? That must have been the thought racing through the mind of a certain father who was looking for his child every day. Undoubtedly, he would go out daily and scan the horizon, searching for his child, his child who had left home. Many times during the day, I'm sure he would go outside, and certainly every evening before bed, he would look, he would glance over the horizon, searching for his wayward child, probably until the day's light and the last hope had finally faded. He was looking for his son, his son who had left home, who thought life away from home was more appealing than life at home. His son who left because maybe his thoughts or his worldview aligned better with someone and something away from home. And so he left. And his father missed him, and he worried about him, and he wanted him home. Probably by now you recognize the story. Maybe you know this father. It's arguably one of the most famous, if not the most famous, parables or teaching stories of Jesus. We call it the parable of the prodigal son, but really it's more about a loving father. It's interesting when you look at the three parables of Jesus in Luke 15, we often refer to them in the negative the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. But that's really not what they are about. You see, Jesus told these stories because he wanted us to understand what it was and what it meant to have a sheep that was found, a coin that was discovered, and a son, a child, who came home. These stories are about recovery and redemption, about joy and celebration. And maybe the shift in how we refer to these stories reflects a shift that we need to make in many of our minds as Christians. 
to slow down on writing people off and double down on encouraging and celebrating people's return home. And so the story is in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus begins the story this way. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, before we go much farther, I think on this Mother's Day, a natural question might be, well, wait a second. I see there's a father, and we see there are sons involved. Where is the mother in this story? And that question has caused much speculation. And many people have said, well, it's probably that she's already passed away, and this father is, father is a, a widower. And, and maybe that's true. Others have said, well, look at the patriarchal society they were in. She's in the background somewhere. She doesn't have a prominent role. In 1947, English painter Carol Waite actually painted his version of this story in a contemporary setting, and he included the mother in his painting. And you can see her running to join her husband and her son in a warm, welcoming embrace. But of course, all of that is speculation. The truth is, this is a parable. This is a story that Jesus made up. And so he told the story the way he did to convey a message, a very important message. And so don't worry, moms. God hasn't forgotten you. God hasn't written you out of his story. God sees great value in you, and so do we. This story is not so much about an absent mother as it is about a present, loving father who extends grace to us all. So in this story, the younger of two sons demands from his father his share of the inheritance. And we see the first unexpected turn in our story. The father actually gives it to him. It's amazing. And I'm sure Jesus' audience was surprised when the father dished over his inheritance. And when you look at the text, what's interesting there is the word used is actually bios, or we might say bios. It's where we get the word biology. It means life. And so this father handed over his life, his life savings, all the resources that had sustained his life. He just handed it over to his sons, including one who was demanding it from him. Think about that. A father giving his life for his children. Does it sound familiar? It doesn't take long to see that the father in our story reflects another father our Father above. It also doesn't take long in the story for the son to liquidate his land. That's probably what his father gave him, land. And evidently, he sells his portion of the land. This would be another insult to his father. First, the son basically says, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could have what's coming to me. And once he gets it, what does he do? He sells it. He sells the land. Land was so important during this day and this time and this culture. And maybe this land had been in the family for a long time. And what does this boy do with it? He gets rid of it. He sells it. How disrespectful. How self-serving. But shockingly, we see no reprimand. We see no rebuke from a resentful father. Again, this would shock Jesus' audience listening to this story. This guy is not acting like a typical father. But of course, that's part of the point of the story. This is no ordinary father. Then to add insult to injury, what does the boy do? He leaves home. The text says he goes to a far country or a distant land, and he uses his father's money to fund his trip, his vacation, his life of pleasure, and the text says reckless living. This was not a family trip to Disney. This was a, I have money burning a hole in my pocket and I am in Vegas kind of trip. This boy didn't stay home and care for his aging father. He didn't, by all accounts, thank his father and say, I'll use this to honor the family or I will invest this money in something that makes a difference in our world. No, in verse 13, it says that he set off to a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild or reckless living. The child left home, and he lived his life by his rules. He found his truth. The world out there appealed to him because maybe in his mind, that's what was most important. 
It aligned with his values and his worldview better than things at home. And for a season, he probably felt like, hey, this is a pretty good choice. This is a win-win situation because probably for him, he had everything he wanted. He had freedom. He had friends. And he had a lot of fun. What else could there be? But if you know the story, you know what happens. His money ran out about the same time a severe famine hit the land. It was a perfect storm. The boy was devastated, and so he ended up getting a job working for a guy in his field, feeding his pigs. Now you have to see what a master storyteller Jesus is, because he includes this detail in this story for a very specific reason, very intentionally. You see, to many of us, pigs are fine. They're a good farm animal. They provide bacon. Pigs are good. But for his Jewish audience, pigs were the symbol of impurity. Pigs were unclean. You didn't eat pigs. You didn't have pigs. You weren't around pigs. And yet this boy is feeding pigs, and he wants the food. He's so hungry, he wants the food he's feeding to the pigs. I guess desperate times do call for desperate measures, and this boy is desperate. Now let me stop right here for a moment. Sometimes in life, we need to hit rock bottom to have our eyes open to the reality of our situation. We need to be awakened to our own lostness. And that's what happens to this boy. And I think sometimes God allows that to happen to us. And maybe sometimes God facilitates that happening or possibly causes it to happen. But I don't want to suggest to you today that things have to be so bad that you have to hit rock bottom before you can come back to God, before you can come back home. You may look at your life and say, man, my life's pretty good. I have a lot of stuff. I have a good job. I have people who care about me. I'm, I'm a long way from rock bottom. And that may be true. But is it possible, if that's the case, that you are living your life in a distant land, in a far country, separate from the life that God created you to live? You don't have to wait until you hit rock bottom to come home to God. Well, for this guy in our story, the trajectory of his decisions combined with some difficult circumstances prompted a moment of clarity back in our text, verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. One of the things that you need to know, one of the things that we all need to remember is the road back home always starts with honest realization. It starts with a, an awareness, a recognition. And that's what happened with this young man. He had to realize where he was, how he got there. He had to realize that the choices he had made up until that point had in essence put him there. He had to realize how bad things were, that he wasn't where he belonged. He also had to realize that back home is where he could find what he needed most. Now, he didn't know how it would go back home, but he knew that's where he needed to be. He knew back home is where he would find what he needed. But he also needed to realize that he had to do something, that he couldn't just lay down in the, in the pig field and, and just wait for someone to come rescue him, that he had to have some initiative. And so what does he do? He picks himself up, he dusts himself off, he swallows his pride, and he begins to put one foot in front of the other towards home. Well, by this point in Jesus' story, the tension is really building for his first century audience. You see, they are probably uncomfortable already at this point. So much has already happened that is probably disturbing them. So many things that they would probably disagree with. And now the big question is, how will this boy be received back home? And in some of the Pharisees' minds, I'm sure what they are thinking is, well, he should grovel, he should beg, he should pledge to pay back everything and more to his father. He's disrespected his father. He's dishonored his family. He has no place around the family table. I'm sure that's what many of them thought. 
You know, it's always much easier to ignore our own struggles when we fixate and focus on other people's struggles. And I can imagine for this young man, all the way home, on that road of regret and remorse, he is practicing his speech. Father, I'm so sorry. Father, I have, I have messed up. This is my fault. Please forgive me. Father, I'll pay back every penny. And as he's walking home, he approaches home, and something most unexpected happens. Verse 20, we see maybe one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture, certainly a beautiful depiction of our Heavenly Father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. That is remarkable. Jewish men did not run. It wasn't acceptable in their culture. For a man in this culture to run, he better be in the Olympics running a race or in a coliseum running from a lion. And yet this father runs. He sees his son. He finally sees his son over the horizon. His emotions are welling up. He can't help himself. So he locks eyes on his son, he hikes up his robe, and he takes off and he sprints to his son. And when he gets there, what does he do? This father who's been disrespected, this father who's been disowned by this boy, embraces him. Throws his arms around him, and he kisses him. If you're one who thinks or processes in images, this is the image that I hope will be etched into your heart and your mind right now. And not just right now, but in this week ahead of you, that this image will be the image that drives you. Much like when you hear a song and it gets stuck in your head, get this image stuck in your head. And I didn't put a picture on the screen because I want you to paint the picture of this father, this out of breath, jubilant father, engulfing his son in love and compassion. You see, that's God. That's our Heavenly Father. That's how God responds when someone who is away comes home. That's the point of the story. God celebrates our return home. So in the story, the boy tries to launch into his speech, but his father interrupts, verse 22. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Whatever you've done, whatever distant land you find yourself in, no matter how far you think you are from God and church and the Bible, you need to know that God celebrates your return home. If you've left the church, or you think your worldview doesn't align with the church, or you disagree with the church, or you feel like the church has pushed you aside or hurt you, would you consider taking some steps back? Just, just make that first step back. Come home. And by home, I mean God and his word and his people. Maybe your life hasn't hit rock bottom. That's fine. It may not, but that doesn't mean that you're living your best life. That doesn't mean that you are where you belong in this life or will be in the next life. So come home. As I've said before in this series, I would like to guarantee you that when you come home, that everyone will receive you like the father in our story. I wish I could tell you that's the case. And maybe it will be. I hope it will be. But if you know this story, this parable of Jesus, you know there is more to the story. There's another son, the older son. And he doesn't quite welcome his brother home like his father did. There's a big party. The father is celebrating his lost son's return. But the older brother isn't participating in the party, and the father goes and finds him, much like he went out to find his younger son. And when he finds the older son, he invites him in. 
But here's what the boy says in verse 29. Look, he says to his father, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. This boy says, Father, I have been here the whole time. I have done everything you expected. I have kept every command. And I'm sure if there were Pharisees in the crowd when Jesus is telling the story, their ears are perking up because they know about keeping commands. That's in their mind how they show they are approved by God. They kept every command. And this older son goes on, I've done all of this. But for this son of yours, and he doesn't even say his brother, he's distancing himself from him. This son of yours, who has brought shame and disrespect on the family, when he finally finds his way back home, you throw a party. You have a celebration. You have a big banquet. And by the way, the money needed to pay for this party ultimately comes out of my pocket. But I want you to see the father's response to the older son. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because the brother, this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. You see, celebration isn't just the appropriate response. It is the necessary response. Celebration is the common link in these three parables in Luke chapter 15. What was dead is now alive. What was lost is now found. And when life emerges, there is great cause for celebration. That's why there are banners and balloons when babies are born. That's why when someone comes to Christ, when someone is baptized into Christ, and they come out out of the water as this new creation in Christ, that's why we celebrate. By the way, that happened a couple of times this past week. That brings us great joy. I want you to watch this video of a father, Matt Goad, baptizing his daughter, Olivia. And I want you to notice the response as she comes up out of the water. We're so proud of you. Uh, so I'm going to take your confession. Uh, Libby, do you believe that Jesus was the Son of Man and that he came to earth as God and man and uh, that he uh, was crucified and died on a cross and on the third day that he uh, was rose again and uh, for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. Based on your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Son, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What a celebration. You see that? A father hugging his child, kissing his child as the family cheers and applauds as we celebrate new life. You see, that's the appropriate response. That's the necessary response when someone comes home, when someone has life and experiences new life in Christ. The appropriate response is not to point fingers. The appropriate response is to party and to celebrate their return. And so if you are contemplating coming home, please hear me. If you come home, will there be some grumpy older brothers around? Yeah, probably. Will it take a lot of humility to begin that journey home? Yes, it will. And will the road home be demanding and difficult sometimes? Absolutely. But I encourage you to come home because coming home is always worth it. It's always worth it. That's where you belong. That's where you will find what you need most. That's where Jesus is. That's where a family of faith is. That's where lasting hope and happiness and joy and purpose and forgiveness and salvation are found. And that's where you will find a father, a loving father who runs to you and throws his arms around you to celebrate your return. Maybe you heard the story of 
Courtney Johnson. Her family and her friends simply call her Coco. Unfortunately, the day after her eighth grade graduation, she was diagnosed with cancer. She had to go through a couple of surgeries and dozens of chemotherapy treatments. She really didn't get to experience her first year of high school because she was always in the hospital. She was always feeling sick. She tried to keep up with her studies, but it was difficult, as you can imagine. Well, two or three weeks ago, Coco actually went through her final chemo treatment at Children's Hospital in L.A. And usually when this happens, there's a big celebration. The child gets to ring the big bell, and the staff is there, and family and friends are there, and there's posters and banners and, and lots of celebrations. But because of the pandemic and some of the restrictions, that couldn't happen. Well, Coco's mother did what many of you mothers would do. She did something. She was talking to her neighbor friend about Coco and about her situation, and she said, I just feel so bad about it. She's finally done with chemo, and I've, I've told her all along, we'll have a big party when it's all over, and now we really can't do much. And as they were talking, they came up with an idea, something they called the reverse parade. And so I want you to see what happened when Coco and her father, in their car, turned the corner and headed down the street towards home after her last chemo treatment. I don't know what heaven's going to be like, but I suspect it might be something like that. A welcoming parade, welcoming us home. And as the church trying to bring heaven to earth, maybe that's how it should be when someone comes home to the church, when someone comes home to Christ, to God, a celebration. So maybe it's time for you to come home. Maybe it's time for you to take that first step on, yes, what could be a demanding and difficult road, but home is where you belong because home is where you will find a loving father who can't wait for your return, who is scanning the horizon, looking for you, wanting you to come home. And when he sees you, he will throw his arms around you. He will celebrate your return. Come home. If there's something we can do for you, if we can pray for you, if we can encourage you to take that first step somehow, or maybe you're ready to give your life to Christ in baptism, please reach out to us. You can go to our website, edmundchurchofchrist.com, fill out the prayer request form there. Be sure and set the settings if you want them public or private, and we will respond to you. This week, as you live out your life in these unusual times, I hope that you will have that image etched into your heart and your mind, the image of an out-of-breath, jubilant father embracing his child. May the Lord bless you and keep you.
want you to know we're very happy that you've worshiped with us today whatever situation you find yourself in we want you to know that we love you and most of all God loves you we want to wish all the mothers a happy Mother's Day but at the same time we want to acknowledge that this is not a easy time for some people and we want you to know again that we love you and most of all God loves you will you pray with me Father, we thank you so much for the time we have to worship you. We pray that you would be with us and help us as we face these difficult times. We ask for strength, courage, and peace. We also ask for patience, kindness, and help us to be considerate to those around us. We ask you that you would especially be with those who are struggling, the difficulties that some have with anxiety and depression at this time. We pray that you would be with them. And we also ask you to use us, help us to be an encouragement, and help us to spread your word and make disciples. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hello, church family. We're excited to let you know that we have a few families placing membership with us. Uh, Stephen and Carly Allen are placing membership, as well as Frank and Yvonne Steinbaugh. Be sure and reach out to them and welcome them to our church family. We're also, we also want to rejoice with two that have put on Christ in baptism, Olivia Goad, which we got to see during the sermon, as well as Marcus McLean. Again, reach out to them and encourage them as they begin their walk with Christ. One more plug for the prayer page. That can be found on our, the homepage of our website. You can list your praise or your prayer requests there. And then I also encourage you uh, just to go to that page anyway and pray for the requests that are posted there. We do wanna be praying for those who have experienced loss. Uh, we have two that have experienced loss recently. We extend our sympathy to Bonnie Brookie and the death of her nephew, as well as Merritt Roberts in the passing of his mother. We have provided another Bible study for you. It mirrors the sermon that Randy brought to us this morning. The discussion is about returning home to a loving father and the celebration that ensues. I hope that will bless your devotional time. On Friday, Sean McElroy did a workshop for us entitled Navigating Uncertainty. And the goal of that was to talk about relational, spiritual, and ment mental health issues. A video of that has been posted to our YouTube site as well as a link uh, that can be found on our website that will take you to that page. We have a mobile blood drive planned for May 24th. That will be from 10.30 to 1.30 in our parking lot. There's a link in our bulletin if you would like to sign up for that and reserve your time slot ahead of time. We also have a drive-by graduate reception planned for uh, May 30th, that will be for our high school seniors, and that will be in our parking lot. And the plan is to have our seniors spaced out in the parking lot and have our members drive by and encourage them and celebrate this milestone with them and their families. We hope to have a senior Bible night later, uh, but this allows us an opportunity to be able to celebrate with them now. I hope you'll keep sending us pictures. We encourage you to send a message that 
was a message to our congregation where you're holding it and encouraging our church family. We have a few to share with you today. First is the Sepulveda family with the message, we miss you, God bless. And I must confess that I'm reading from the English sign and I'm having faith that the Spanish sign says something similar. Next is the Miller family. They brought you a puzzle and I'll give you a couple seconds to uh, look at that. The message is, we miss you all. Or if you're from Oklahoma, it's we miss y'all. But uh, I appreciate the puzzle. The Collins family is next. We uh, included a message from them that is from Mr. Rogers, a quote from Mr. Rogers. Let's make the most of this beautiful day. I hope you'll keep sending us those pictures. They're an encouragement. I hope that they're an encouragement to you. It is Mother's Day, and I just want to add my voice to the many that have said, Happy Mother's Day. And we are thankful to God for the mothers that have been provided to us. We have a video of our members remembering their moms and talking about their moms. Enjoy. I love mom because she makes me smile and laugh. She helps me whenever I get hurt, and she feeds me. She plays with me sometimes, and she lets me do lots of crafts. And she is my mommy, and she's so sweet, and I love her. I love my mom because I'm her favorite. I love my mom because I'm her favorite. I love because my I mom, mom because obviously I'm her favorite. favorite. She helps me when um, I need her. Because I am my mommy. Because her helpful. She works hard and is helpful. She loves me so much. My mom will always be kind, caring, and loving. My mom always puts, texts me in bed, and she puts my back. Kisses me before bedtime. My mom always helps me when I'm scared. My mom always helps me solve any problem I come to her with. My mom always makes food and sometimes I don't like the food, but sometimes I do. Thank you, Mama, for being nice. Thank you, Mama, for loving me. Thank you, Mom, for being so amazing and always caring about me. Thank you for showing me what it means to share God's unconditional love. Thank you, Mom, for teaching me to be a Christian. Thank you, Mom, for always supporting me and my family and sometimes pestering us. Thank you, Mom, for always supporting me. Thank you for always showing us the true love of God and uh, showing us how to grow old gracefully, living life to its fullest and enjoying every moment. To all of those who have been a mom to someone, thank you. Thank you. To all those who've been a mom to someone. Thank you. Thank you. It takes effort. It takes effort. It takes effort. Determination and lots of love. And lots of love. And lots of love. And lots of love. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you for being our moms. Thank you for being our moms. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. I love you and happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day! 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 Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. What a beautiful tribute to so many amazing moms. Well, that's all of our announcements. Have a blessed week. May God bless our efforts to be disciples and make disciples.